And so today I want to talk about the second part of this series. And I want to talk about going deeper. You see, offering our lives to Him is to go deeper. And uh, let me read to you that first part of that passage in our series. So the verse is just this. Therefore, let me read it again. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So let's go before the Lord and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We now open our hearts and minds to you. We ask God that you would speak into our life. Lord, let your word come forth. Let it be rooted in our hearts. Lord, that it'll bring transformation in our lives so that we can demonstrate it every single day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me just give you a little bit of a context here. The Apostle Paul is uh, talking in a language that they understood in their time. You see, um, as was already alluded to by Pastor Paul last week, that you know he was trying to uh, explain to the Roman church, the church uh, that had Roman Christians and Jewish Christians, and he was trying to align their beliefs and uh, letting, letting them break out of their uh, traditions and practices and turning them into uh, being able to understand what it really means to follow God. And so he's, he's turning them around. And so he's telling them now, you've got to understand it's not the same anymore. You don't have to do all of those things. This is what we need to do now. So in the Old Testament, they offered dead animals for sacrifice. So in the Old Testament, if you're going to worship, you see, before you can, before you can worship the Lord you have to make sure that you bring a sacrifice. And so that sacrifice to be pleasing to God must be unblemished, something that is perfect, basically. Something that is pleasing to God. So you would bring this, this sacrifice and you'd have to offer it. It would have to be burned. It would be, you know, you'd have to kill it. So it's a dead sacrifice. It's something that you, you would bring to please God for your worship. That's your worship. You don't go to worship without bringing a sacrifice. And so Paul is saying, the Apostle Paul, not Pastor Paul, but <laughs> Apostle Paul said that, you know, in those days they had to do that. You had to all this dead sacrifice. Now you don't do that anymore because, again, of God's mercy because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. And because of that sacrifice, he, uh, he, he died for us. He took our place and we don't need to do that anymore. We don't need to bring dead sacrifices anymore. Aren't you glad that it won't be bloody in here? I mean, you don't imagine all the blood and all of that. Now, you know, you, you don't have to do that anymore. Because Jesus took our place. He was the ultimate sacrifice. Why is the ultimate sacrifice? Because it was a perfect sacrifice. He was sinless. That was the only thing that is pleasing to God. And because of that, ever since, there is no more sacrifices that have to be made. But there is a new one. And that new one is now, because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, because of his mercy, now you and I have to offer our lives as the sacrifice. That is alive, not a dead sacrifice. We are no good to God dead. Right? It's a living sacrifice that we're now offering before the Lord. Amen? And so the Bible says that that life that we offer to God, for it to be uh, a worship before him, is it should be a life that is a sacrifice. It is a life that um, is pleasing and holy to God, and it's a life that is a true worship to him. So what does it mean when it comes to our lives? So... I'm just going to break it down today, and I'm going to share with you that if I'm going to offer my life, as I offer my life to God, here's what I need to do. I'm going deeper in my commitment. That's the first thing. I'm going to go deeper in my commitment. The Bible says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So why go deeper in commitment? Because commitment involves sacrifice. Would you agree? I mean, in anything you commit to, 
you're going to have to make a sacrifice. You're going to have to give up something uh, because you're committed to something. I know we don't like to talk about sacrifices, you know, uh, in the church, uh, especially in the beginning of the year. We're, we're so used to, you know, we want the blessing of God, prosperity, you know, all of the great things, you know, amazing things, all positive. And that's great. But the truth of the matter is, you can't make a commitment without sacrifice. So we need to talk a lot about sacrifices too. You see, um, it's not just about, uh, you know, uh, all the blessings, but we need to make, uh, to, to understand that when we're committed, we need to make sacrifices. The greater the commitment, the greater the sacrifice. Tell the person beside you, greater commitment, greater sacrifice. All right, so for example, for example, if you wanted a commitment to pray and fast, there you go. If, we're, if you're committed to do that, you have to give up certain things in your life, right? I mean, may, maybe before, you know, your routine was that you get up, you go to work, or you, you, you take a shower, you eat your breakfast, and, and then go to work, right, or whatever. And then all of a sudden, now you're committed to prayer and fasting, so what are you going to do? So now you've got to block out a time that you could pray, Right? You can say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure that because I'm committed to prayer, I'm going to block out that time. And if you're going to be fasting, you're going to make sure that you're going to deny certain things in your life because you're making a sacrifice. If you're committed to fasting, there's certain things you said, well, I'm, I'm committed to fasting, so I'm not going to eat on this thing because I, I did commit for that. And it's between you and God, of course, and not about you know, you and I, I mean, please don't judge somebody if they're eating something, you know, because that's not their, you know what I'm saying? We, we're, we're not to judge other people how you're fasting, yeah. right? You say, well, how come you're eating that? You should be fasting. Remember, the pastor declared it. <laughs> you know, and look at so-and-so, you know, they're eating uh, all the pork and all that. You know? <laughs> no, 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 no. You, it's not about them. It's about you. What is your commitment? What is your sacrifice before God? You see, so when we're committed to something, we, we, we sacrifice. When you commit to worship, for example, you know, commitment to come and worship in the house of God, you know, there are certain times. Like, for example, now you're going to maybe 10 o'clock. Wow, you're going to wake up 30 minutes earlier, <laughs> right? And, and so it's different. So you, when, you're, when you're going to be committed to worship, you know, you, you, you don't just say, okay, well, you know, I'll just do the same thing. I'll continue to be late. You know, I'll continue to be just coming whenever I want. Well, no. If you're deeper in your commitment, if you want to see changes in your life, you're going to say, well, I'm committed to worship, so I'm going to do what I need to do to get there. If I have to wake up earlier, if I have to uh, fix the, the, the children or, or, or get everything ready before I can come, that's a commitment. And that involves sacrifice. That is a life of sacrifice. That is not just comfort. Everything is just okay. So when you're committed to something, you're going to give up something. So if you, if you this year say, well, you know, I'm going to make sure I'm committed to whatever time that you're going to come. Let's say I'm going to come for 10 o'clock or, or if this is going to be at 1 p.m. If I'm committed to that, then I'm going to make sure I'm there when it starts. Because, you know, coming there anytime I want is not a commitment. And it's not a sacrifice. Because you didn't sacrifice, you just took your time, whatever, right? But when you're committed to something, it's like making an appointment with someone. When you make an appointment with someone, you want to make sure you're there. You may have to give up something just to get there on time because you know the person's waiting for you. And that's the same when we're committed to worship. So we come and we, we have to give up something. We need to make some sacrifices. That's what it means. If you, have a, if you have a commitment to grow in your spiritual life, for example, to, to have that commitment, that means maybe I have to, you know, I have to take time, I have to make some sacrifice in reading the Word of God. Maybe throughout the day I don't have time because my work is busy and all of that, but I am making a commitment that, that I am going to read the Word of God and, and maybe even for a few minutes, that's a commitment I make. And because of that, I'm going to make a sacrifice. 
So living a life of sacrifice is what God wants us to be, right? So it's not just comfort. So we, I have to set aside time to be able to read the Word of God or maybe to even attend a life group. You know, in, in, in the house here at CLC, we believe in the life group. This is where you come in and you have other people who can share with you, who can, uh, you know, walk with you in your spiritual journey. And so uh, if you're committed to a life group, then you have to block out your schedule. If, you, if it's Thursday or Friday or Sunday afternoon, whatever it may be, you're committed to that and you're going to block out that time. So when people ask you, are you available? Yeah, no, I'm not available. I'm sorry. I've got a schedule. I've got my life group. That's a, that's a sacrifice because there could be a party going on. Maybe somebody's going to have a party, but you're committed to a life group. You have brothers and sisters that you're committed to. You don't just cancel them and just go ahead and do that. Now that's living a life of comfort. Because living a life of sacrifice means I'm going to give up what I need to give up so that I can go to the thing that God desires for my life. If I want to grow in my spiritual journey, then it's going to take some sacrifices. And some of that would mean blocking out some of your time so that you could accomplish what's God's desire for you. Amen? Amen? And so, you know, same thing with relationship. If you're committed to relationship, you're going to give up something. You may have to give up some of your desires or your interests because you're committed. You don't always get what you want, right? You have to consider the interests of the other person. That is a commitment to a relationship. See, if you're always getting what you want, nobody wants to be with you because you always get what you want. But if you have a relationship, you want to make sure that you are able to make some sacrifices to, to commit to the person and, and give up some of your interests to consider the interests the interest of other people. That is the sacrifice. Now, just like you know, in marriage, for example, you know, when you marry someone, Right? You even make promises, I will go to the moon and back for you. I mean, I love the moon, you know. You know I, I will go over the mountains for you. You know, all these kind of commitments and things that we say. But really, when we, when we have a commitment to a marriage, a relationship, there's some things we got to give up. There's some sacrifices we have to make to to maintain and continue in that relationship because not everything's going to be going good. There's going to be times where it's difficult. There's going to be some conflict. There's going to be issues. But because I'm committed to this, I'm going to make some sacrifices. I'm willing to go through it. And remember, as I'm sharing this to you, you're not coming in from a position of weakness because of God's mercy. Remember, you're coming in already because you have a fresh start, because you can overcome, and because you're deeply loved. You can do these things. You can make these sacrifices because your starting point is you are loved by God. Amen? You know, following Christ is denying yourself, taking up your cross, Jesus said, you know, and following him. That is, that is being able to make sacrifices to follow Jesus, right? Like even for serving. When we are serving, sometimes we have to give up. You know, there are people here that are serving that maybe may come earlier because they are serving. There's, some of them have to leave later because they're serving. Some of them have to come days before to prepare because they're serving. So there are some sacrifices that we make. Not all of us have the same kind of sacrifice. But nevertheless, it's our sacrifice before God. Amen? That's what God wants. God looks at the way we live our life. You know, I remember when, um, when we were starting as a church. I mean, I was a pastor, so we were starting with three little kids. You know, just like Pastor Paul now. I mean, you know, one-year-old and two-year-old and four-year-old. And, and so we were like, you know, and I'm, of course, I need to be there early and I'd be the one there last. And, and think about this. During that time, we didn't have a nice facility. We had to, we had to bring everything. We had to set up. 
You know, bring all the equipment, bring the stuff, and, and, and I, would, I would be the one to go ahead first and set up the place and, you know, with other people in the team, you know, maybe uh, uh, get their stuff from the storage and bring it in. I mean, imagine in the winter time. Right, I remember, you know, like this time, you know, you have all this snow out there, and you would be, you would be going out, you know, already heating up the car, you know, taking out the snow and all of that, and then you know, put in the the pants and the, the snow pants and the the jackets and everything on each one of them, waiting. And by the time you get to the third one, the first one is crying. Ah, it's so hot, you know. Right, that would fall. <laughs> But, 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 uh, but you see, you got all of them already, right? You're dressing them all up and bringing them all. It's just so hot and all that. I mean, the kind of sacrifice, and I, you know, every Monday I wanted to quit. And then for 30 years I was going, ah, Lord, this is it. Enough sacrifice, right? So you think, like, that's a sacrifice, but it's a sacrifice I was making because I was serving the Lord. Your sacrifice may be different. You know, so my sacrifice, like, uh, you know, as, as a pastor, you know, at times you could be sometimes in a, in a party. There's something going on, and it's nice. People invited you. You're there. But you got to preach the following day, and you got to go, oh, I can't stay. You know, um, I'm sorry. I, I have to go because I need to prepare. I need to wake up early in the morning to, to prepare and all of that. So there are some sacrifices that I have to to do to, to get to the place where God wants me to be. And so I want you to think about that in your own life. What sacrifices are you willing to make for your life to go deeper in your commitment to God? So when we go deep in our commitment, we need to break out of our comfort. You see, like, for example, if I'm going to go out to the hallway there, you know, I'm, I need to get out of the sanctuary to get to the hallway. You can't enter into the hallway without getting out of somewhere. So we need to break out of our comfort if we're going to go deeper and living a life of sacrifice. So in the same way, you see, I, I, wanna, I want you to just imagine for a moment. This is your comfort zone. Ima have an imaginary circle. This, this comfort zone that we have would be, you know, my schedule, my life. This is my routine. This is what I do, how I do things. Now, for me, to grow in my spiritual walk, there will be times where God would call me out of that, to, to sacrifice. And so, here's, here's, my, here's my decision that I have to make. So, this is comfortable for me. My schedule during the week, during the day, this is what I do. I'm okay. And then somebody says, well, we need to have a life group, or we need, to, you, know, we need you to volunteer on this. So, so now you've got to step out of your comfort zone. The question you ask yourself is, do I step out into growth or move back into safety? Because it's safe to be in my comfort zone, correct? I'm just safe here. It's okay. This is my normal life. But to step out is going to take sacrifice. And so going, uh, going to sacrifice in our life is stepping out of our comfort, right? So many times people have the wrong impression that to be a Christian is to live a comfortable life. Where our families just enjoy life and have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. It's much easier to stay home and watch some episodes, right? Uh, and, and, you know, r rather than being with the church family. But here's the important truth. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you surrendered your life to him, you have given your life to him. Your life is no longer yours. He redeemed you. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you? You have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. See, friends, our life is no longer ours. Honoring God is to offer our lives as a sacrifice. Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, is that true of your life? See, it wasn't comfortable for Jesus to give up his life. 
He suffered for our sakes. He came down from heaven and sacrificed so that you and I can live the life that he wants for us. I think it was Benny Hinn who said, the son of God became a son of man so that the sons of men can become sons of God. He offered his life to us so that we can have life. See, so, he, so as children of God, we need to break out of our comfort. Paul said in Romans 8, 16 to 18, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The Bible tells us that, friends, my encouragement to you that even though we may have some sacrifices, even though we may, have, we may face some suffering, it says that our suffering cannot compare to the glory that we have with God. Amen. That one day we're going to face him and he can say, enter into the joy of the Lord. And that glory will not compare to the, all the sacrifices that we make. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. There's, no, there's nothing that can compare to that, to, to that sacrifice, you know. And besides, I don't even think the, the, the sufferings that the Apostle Paul was talking about is the same sufferings that we, we experience. When he was talking about the present sufferings, he was talking about being jailed, you know, being persecuted, being hanged, you know, uh, being beaten. That's the suffering he was talking about. What suffering do we have? I mean, I mean, in North America, at least, I don't know in other, in other countries and, or so, but, but in North America, probably our suffering is maybe shoveling snow. You know, a bit of shoveling snow. Maybe working is, is a suffering. You know, working so many hours. Maybe, maybe sometimes because we're committed to, to our faith in Christ that maybe sometimes we lose some sleep. Or maybe we, we miss a meal. You know, I, I mean, can that really compare to the sufferings he was talking about? I mean, if we put it in context, that suffering cannot even compare. Right? So may the Lord help us break out of our comfort and deepen our commitment so we can be counted worthy to be his co-heirs. So as I, secondly, as I offer my life, I'm going deeper in my faith. See, the Bible says our lives must be holy and pleasing to the Lord. Amen? That means going deeper in faith. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, And without faith, it is impossible. Say impossible. impossible. Impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. See, friends, we must break out of our compromise and our comfort, right, and, and, and conformity and stand in our faith in God. You know, if, if you have compromised before, don't compromise anymore. In view of God's mercy, we look at this year and say, God, I don't want to compromise anymore in my faith. I want to deepen that faith in you that I'm not going to compromise. The devil wants to derail us, uh, derail our faith by lying to us, to deceive us that we can live our lives according to our ways and not follow God's will. You know, that's why... Sometimes people talk about God, but they live their lives as if God doesn't even exist. Think about that. I mean, sometimes people talk about, you know, yeah, I, I know Jesus, I, you know, but the way they live their life is as if Jesus doesn't even exist, as if he's not even coming back again and holding us accountable to our life. So we need to really think about these things that, you know, he holds us accountable and, and the devil wants us to be in a place where, you know, he deceives us and he doesn't want us to follow God's will. But the Bible tells us that we should not be shaped by the ways of the world. Because the world has a way of doing things that, that goes against God's word. That's what the world does. And that's what the devil wants us to be. You know, for example, the, the world wants us to always promote number one. Who's number one? <laughs> right? Always, it's about us. 
Now, come on, let's, let's really be honest here. How many of you, you know, when you post something, you're thinking, is my, is my post really getting famous? <laughs> How many likes am I getting, you know? How many likes in my, in, my, uh, in my Facebook page? Or how many likes is my reel getting, you know? I mean, I know I get excited. Wow, look at that, you know? Even, even uh, Facebook gives that to you and feeds your ego. <laughs> and they hear, you know, you, so you're thinking, wow, you know. And that's why sometimes people get depressed when, when there's no likes. <laughs> oh, nobody likes me anymore. <laughs> Just because you don't see any likes on the Facebook page. Right? But you see, you know, because we have been accustomed to thinking that, you know, being famous, that, you know, somehow I'm, I'm going to get known. My, 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 my page is going to get well known. My, my uh, you know, all my posts and my reels and all the things I'm posting that I'm going to get well known. See, friends... I want you to, to listen to this quote. Billy Graham quote, uh, said this. He said, what is the use of being famous on earth when heaven doesn't know your name? Amen. Think about that. So really, it's not about being popular and what pleases me, but the word of God is contrary. It says in Colossians 1.10, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. So deepening in my faith is living a life that pleases God by bearing fruit, breaking out of my complacency, which is, which is just being satisfied with the mediocre life and, and just relax, everything's just fine. You know, the devil wants us to be fruitless and passionless because he does not want us to do the will of God. We know that it will not please God. But I need to break out of that. I need to break out of that kind of complacency because I am a child of God. I am an overcomer. I'm not the, I'm not the tail, I'm the head. Yeah. Amen? Come on, give praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> I got to break out of my complacency. Deepening my faith is living a life that is holy because we are called to be holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16, it says, But just as he called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. So we need to break out of a life of compromise. and Things that do not align to the righteousness of God. We need to walk in the holiness of God. Uh, when we recognize that the one who called us is holy, then his holiness demands our commitment to be holy. You know, holiness is the habit of being one in mind with God, hating what he hates, loving what he loves, and measuring everything in this world by the standard of his word. Friends, we must live our lives holy and pleasing to God. We please God, and when we please God, we will please people. So we don't please people. We, we please God. And the more we please God, we know how to please people. Amen? Amen? Yes. 1 Peter 2, 9, 10, uh, 9 to 12 said, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his mar wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Again, there's the word, you know, because of the mercy of God. This is who we are in God. See, living a life of holiness doesn't necessarily mean living a life without sin, uh, but it means a life that is separated unto God. It means we are not like ordinary people. We have a standard. We are set apart for the Lord. We are special people. Holiness means being different from the Lord. Do we know who we belong we should be different from the world. Peter emphasizes our unique position. We are a people separate unto God. We are to live accordingly, right? Because he called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
The Bible says you were once lost, but now you are found. Hallelujah. You were not his people, but now you are people of God. We are now special people. We are chosen. Come on, tell the person beside you, you are chosen. We, we didn't qualify, right? Thanks be to God, it's because of his mercy. You are now his people. And so God calls us that in the midst of permissiveness in this world, where everything seems to be acceptable, where doing evil is cool in this environment, in, you know, and, 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 and abortion is a matter of choice, where churches twist the word, of God to justify their actions. And, and, and let me just speak to the young people. Young people, it's going to take an effort to stand in faith in your generation. There's so much happening in our world that you need to stand up for the things of God and not to compromise. We must deepen our faith to stand, to live holy lives that is pleasing to God. And holy and pleasing life to God means Aligning our actions, our thoughts, our choices uh, with God's principles and values. It involves a commitment to righteousness, to, to moral purity in a transformed mindset. And when pleasing God in this context it means obedience to his will and embracing a lifestyle that reflects his character. Friends, let us strive to align our actions with our beliefs. Seek forgiveness when needed and aim to serve others with a compassionate heart. And regularly attending worship and staying connected to a supportive community, a faith community like this can also contribute to a holy and pleasing life. And finally, thirdly, as I offer my life, I'm going deeper in true worship. Paul says your life is that is holy and pleasing to God is your true worship. This is how you worship your life. Many times people think it's the songs. <laughs> That's why there's so much debate in that gone on in the church. Is it supposed to be fast songs, slow songs, be hymn songs? You know, and there's so much debate that has gone on, loud or soft. But the truth is, God is not looking to what songs we sing and how we sing them, or how good we are. He's more interested with our lives. Right? He's more interested. Is it pleasing to him? How do you live your life from Monday to Saturday? It's great to be in the house of God and, and do all of this, but how do you live your life when you leave this place? See, they think it's just singing. Some people think that's just about it. And so that's why they can just miss the singing. You know, I, I don't need to be there. I just miss the singing. They don't see that. When you come into the house of God, you're offering your lives as worship. And so your commitment to do that is not because of the singing. So it's not like, oh, I'll just miss the singing. It's just singing anyway. You know what I'm saying? Oh, it's just singing. I can be late. No. God is looking at your attitude. Because your attitude in coming to the house of God must be an attitude of saying, uh, from the moment you come here, even from the decision coming here, you're already offering your life. Saying, I'm already making this commitment. I'm already getting out of my comfort zone. I'm coming here because I want to worship God. And so that is true worship. Offering your life. Yes, singing is part of it, but it's not that. You can sing all you like. But if your life is far from God, that is not worship to God. It says in Amos 5, 23 to 24, Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. See, the Lord is more concerned with your life, your righteousness. Amen. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 15, uh, 7 to 9. You hypocrites, I say, I was right when he prophesied about you. He's talking about the Pharisees and all that. He says, These people honor me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. See, friends, true, honor, uh, true worship honors God more with our hearts. That is worship before the Lord. And, you know, in reading, in reading the Bible, there is, there is a principle called first mention. 
And it, it helps us to understand with the meaning of that word uh, when we see when it's first mentioned. And so the first mention of worship was in the book of Genesis. It says in Genesis 22, verse 4 to 5. It says, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship. Then we will come back to you. Now, this is a story of Abraham and Isaac, and God asked Abraham to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. Now, God made a covenant with Abraham that he will multiply to be the father of many nations, but it, it takes on sacrifice. And so he tells his servant, I'm going to go to worship, right? And I'm going to come back. Now, I want you to think when he was going to go and he mentioned, I'm going to go worship, he was not talking about, I'm going to sing a few songs. He didn't have a guitar. He didn't have a worship team with him, all right? So he was going to worship because what he was thinking is, I'm going to lay down a life. Worship is a life laid down for God. So that's what it means. We worship God with our lives. When we live a holy and pleasing to God, a life pleasing to God, this is worship. Look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. It says this. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. As you can see in this passage, the, the altar is not a physical place in your home. It is our life, right? Right? Some people build physical altars to worship God. Now, they did that in the Old Testament. They would pick stones wherever they were. They would get stones, and then they would build an altar and worship God. So that was the language. But you see, now God is not looking for those dead stones. He said, well, he's looking for living stones that you and I, and we offer our lives as, as stones before the Lord, and we create an altar for him. Our lives should build the altar for God. So you and I are living stones. And as you and I are offering our life to God, we're building an altar. And so wherever you go, where you offer your life, and you lay down your life and commit to him, that is your altar. And that's the reason why when we do the altar calls, they come and come to the altar. What we're really saying is, come offer your life. Come offer your life. Because wherever you are, where you're offering your life to God to do his will, that is the altar before God. He is looking for, for lives, living lives who will lay down their life and build an altar before the Lord. That is the worship. Friends, at the altar is where God meets you. We need to break out of our traditions and habits of just attending church, just attending the worship and not even expecting anything. Oh, I just got to go there just to get in, do my sign in or, or, or my attendance and my leader knows I was there. But is that really why we come together? You need to change the way we think that when we come on a Sunday, we're offering our lives. I'm saying together with others, we're building an altar before God that we'll be pleasing to him, to worship him. We together, we're coming together, we come here. So we're coming expecting God to do something in our life, to bring transformation in our life. So we're coming in faith expecting, we come, Lord, I'm going to come there. You know, what is it that you're going to speak into my life? What is it that you're going to share in my life that I need to make changes? What is it, God, that you're going to do for me today when I come into the house of God? That's expectation. When we come to the house of God, we're expecting that God will move. It's not just same thing every week. It's not just another Sunday. Every, come, every time we come together, we're building an altar before God to worship Him. And when the worship goes up, the blessings come down. Hallelujah! Are you expecting? Listen, you get what you expect. You're not expecting anything. You don't get anything. But when you come to the house of God, expecting, because you're worshiping the Lord, 
you will receive the blessing from God. So will you be willing to deny yourself to follow Him? Revival comes to our lives when we die to ourselves and obey His commands, His will for us. Friends, if we want to see changes in our lives, we need to break out of the things that keep us from the will of God for our lives. Let us not continue to do the same thing that we have done before. Let us go deeper in our commitment, deeper in our faith, and deeper in our worship before the Lord. And how do I do that? Well, don't follow the world with what they're doing. Be transformed by changing the way you think.